Hello everyone, I hope you're all well and keeping safe. Uh, my name's Dr. Morley and joining me from uh, down the road is my sister who you might already know as Dr. Annie. Hello Annie. Hi, hi Morley. Hi. Um, so we've had a lot of questions and emails and messages about the RCA. So we thought we'd make a, a little video just about our thoughts and try to answer some of the questions that you had uh, about the RCA examination. We, you know, with all the questions that we've been getting, we've tried to boil it down to a few common themes that we've noticed um, and a few things that you're mainly worried about. For example, sort of what cases to submit is what a lot of people are worried about. Um, and another, another interesting question we've had, I know, is uh, how do you record it? Okay. Um, so one question that stood out in particular came into our, uh, one of our website users. Um, thank you for sending in that question. Um, so thank you for all your help and support. We're finding the RCA pretty stressful. Uh, the CSA and real life GP cases are not the same. Please can you expand a bit on more suitable cases to record for children? I have GP cases like D and V, fever and normal rashes, where after assessment using the knife traffic light system and providing more reassurance, any basic follow-up is needed. Not sure whether it'd be complex enough compared to the cases for the CSA. And it's quite a, a good question, wouldn't you say? Yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of trainees that are, uh, that are in this situation and they are um, needing some information about what are the best cases that they can submit um, for the RCA examination. So yeah, this is, this is a good question. So you being a GP trainer, uh, you're, you're probably more clued up on this than, than I might be. Um, but, you know, what, what, going back to the question of what cases to submit, you know, generally always people are looking for interesting cases. Um, I mean, what is your opinion on that? What do you think? Um, on um, the RCGP website, um, I think people who are in the situation that they need to be um, applying to the RCA may have already been sent some links to the RCGP website and they've got specific guidance on there now about um, the examination policy plus a handbook for the RCA in particular. Now, in that handbook, it does say it needs to be a spread of different cases. So just generally talking about the cases that you should be submitting, you need to have um, a spread of cases that covers the curriculum. Um, you need to have a spread of patients from pediatric patients over to um, sort of old age um, patients as well. Um, you need to have at least one mental health um, concern. Um, you need to show in one case that you are managing a long-term condition. Um, may that be somebody with multiple comorbidities or somebody palliative, somebody with cancer, something like that. Um, and you need to have a case that um, relates to urgent or unscheduled care. So I think if I were you, I'd make sure there is at least one of those cases in your um, submissions. Going back to um, the email that you have just discussed about paediatric cases in particular and what you should be including, things like simple D and V or a cough and cold, I don't think is going to be appropriate because they need to be cases that an ST3 level um, trainee would be able to manage. And those kind of cases, I would really expect if it was a simple, just D and V, then ST2 or even an ST1 would be able to manage themselves. So um, I would probably be looking at cases that it may have a simple component to it, but there may be something more complicated from maybe the social background, and um, there could be a child protection issue that you need to discuss. I wouldn't just have a cough, a simple cough or a cold or a simple diarrhea and vomiting case. Um, I would try and have some, if there's some other aspect of it that makes it more complicated, you need to have something like that, really, something a bit more meaty. And I guess that going back to that original point about the, you know, people are always using the term interesting cases. It, it you know, interesting is probably not the best term to use because even a you know you're potentially going i know you said diarrhea and vomiting is potentially simple but it's things like that could uh, essentially be more interesting if there is a safeguarding element for example yeah. i mean that, that would be your definition but for complex cases as well if you think about that definition of com complexity i think it's expanding beyond that 
Yeah, you need to kind of be showing off your skills so that you can get the maximum marks because the RCA is going to be marked um, in a very similar way to the CSA. And if you have a look at um, the CSA um, mark schemes, the things that they're trying to get out, if you have a simple case like diarrhea and vomiting or a cough um, that's very, very straightforward and the management's very, very straightforward, that you may not be able to show off as much as you would do if it's a little bit more complicated or something else to it yeah and 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 that's right i think one thing that's that's you know quite an advantage of the rca i guess is that unlike the csa exam you have more control over what cases you can submit um that is true um but at, at the same time you need to make sure that your case that you're going to submit is a run through. So when you're recording it, you can't be editing it. So it will be like you are in the CSA. But yeah, you're right. You can pick the best of your cases. So you can record, if you have time, you could record 50 cases and pick the best of the 13, which you think shows off your um, your skills. And I mean, could you think of any particular examples of what might be counted as a little bit more of a complex case just for argument's sake? Um, in terms of a, a pediatric um, so going, pediatric case, yeah, so going, um, back, going to back to the question, question yeah. um, as I mentioned, it could be something to do with child protection. So it could be very, very simple um, that you do the diarrhea and vomiting, but there may be something from the case that you think may be of concern um, or the parent has a concern about something else um, other than the diarrhea and vomiting. Um, so it, it really it really depends. And unfortunately, and like the CSA, it's not going to be something you can fully control in terms of the case and the presentation that people are going to come to you with. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's just really making sure that you you pick a case that's not very simple that an ST1 or ST2 would be able to handle and deal with. Um, very easily it needs to be at the standard for, for an ST3 um, so you could have for example um, a, a pediatric case of say balanitis um, and I mean that's a pretty simple one to manage but it could be something like a recurrent balanitis so you might have to discuss um, it, do they need to have a circumcision do they need a secondary care referrals or something like that with a bit more to it than just the just balanitis by itself and then, you know, a lot of the times when I've been consulting anyway, I've used things like video consultations as an adjunct to a telephone consultation. And I'd presume for RCA purposes as well, would you be applying the same sort of principles, would you think? So would you be going from a telephone consultation for a video consultation, for example, or would you just be doing a straight video consultation and preparing with the patient? Yes, this is going to be a video consultation. I mean... Um, well, the RCGP website and um, their guidance to say you can have a mixture of all the different consultations. So you can have a, um, a video consultation, face to face consultation, or you can just have an audio, a traditional telephone triage consultation. Um, in my experience, when you're using these different platforms, um, it can take some time for the patient to say log into a video consultation if you're changing from an audio one to a video one, and that will eat into your 10 minutes time um, that you have to show off your skills because um, your consultation has to be recorded from start to finish, but they're only going to they're only going to look at the 10 minutes. So if it takes, for example, a minute for your patient to log in uh, onto the video consultation, that's a minute gone. And I guess that's the key point, isn't it, really? We're trying to bring us on to how to record it a little bit, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, you know, if, you know, if you're talking about the fact that switching over from one cons consultation medium to another, so from telephone to video consultation, and that eats into your time, it seems prudent to just pick one of them yeah. um, in advance, for, particularly for your, you know, for your case complexity almost. And yeah. You know, if it was me, for example, I would literally just prep it as a video consultation every single time. I think that all, you know, obviously you're going to get people where that's not possible, particularly in the elderly who, who or people who are not very tech savvy. You're not going to be able to do a video consultation particularly easy, you know, particularly easy with them. I mean, there are particular ways around this. You know, if they do have a carer who's able to come in and you can arrange the time for that to happen, that's potentially one one way around that sort of issue. Um, so yeah, go leading on to the question of, you know, how would you physically record it? Obviously, you know, it, it, you know, there hasn't really been much guidance so far, has there, about 
how to, how to actually record it other than the fact it shouldn't be edited and you should try and include the patient patient's face as well as your own face within the recording so um yeah i think the best way really to um, record these consultations are probably having a camera set up um or your phone set up um just behind you so they can see you um looking at your screen or or you you can have your camera pointed at your screen if it's just a video consultation um i think it doesn't, if you want to do an, um, an audio, so an, a traditional telephone consultation, that is fine, but the camera just needs to be on you um, and you need to be able to hear the responses of the patient. So it may be worth having um, the phone on speaker um, so you can clearly hear the responses of the patient as well. Um, but as long as it's, it's run through completely, you do need to get consent at the beginning and that's not included in the 10 minute time um, that the examiner is going to be marking you. Um, but you do need to make sure you have consent um, and the patient needs to be, know that they can withdraw that consent at any time. And it, and um, I so I think the best way is to have like a video facing you or if it is a, a complete video consultation that you're doing, you can um, save the picture of the screen um, and the, some platforms will, will allow you to do that and then you can upload that. Um, but once you've done that, those of you who are applying for the RCA, you will be given um, links um, for the 14 fish platform so that you can submit all the information safely. Um, I think the only concern as well about maybe um, recording things on your phone is if it's going to be automatically uploaded like to the cloud, in which case there may be a security issue. So it's just making sure that you follow the links and try and um, look at ways of directly uploading onto the 14 fish platform. I think sort of, again, working in sort of several IT sort of situations recently, obviously cybersecurity is definitely a big risk and people do have their smartphones and there's obviously that danger of carrying uh, carrying and potentially confidential patient data in the form of a consultation out of the surgery with you. I guess, you know, you'd hope your surgery would be very accommodating for this. And essentially, if you've been doing recording your consultations pre-coronavirus, pre-social distancing, essentially all you're replacing your patient with is with a telephone which a telephone or a computer screen that's having, you know, that's showing some forms of video consultation or or, or, the, or recording the telephone. That, that's the only difference how I see it. And, it. and rather than using your phone to do the recording for that, I think it's prudent enough that you might need to ask your practice. They don't already have one, maybe to get you a camera. Um, yeah. I mean, don't get me wrong. You know, if you look online, you can get various... GoPro clones, for example, or action cameras, which are anywhere between sort of 30, 30 to 50 pounds. Um, you know, if you're willing to spend that much money on it, that's fair enough. You know, that, that's, your, that, that's your prerogative. But really, you should be getting a lot of this equipment from your, your, your GP or your trainer who should be helping to facilitate your learning. I mean, you can feel free to disagree with me or not with that. Well, I, th I think the majority of practices would have um, videos anyway um, to allow them to do the, um, the work-based assessments. So I, I think most people will, will have that um, already. I think it's just being careful when you're recording things on your personal device and you'll know much more than, than I will about that. Um, but it is just being careful on, on the modality you use to record your um, consultations. You, you kind of hit the you already hit the nail on the head of that, and you know more than you, you think. You know, you, you, in terms of uploading to the cloud, is what you you, you said. You know, that's yeah. that is a very valid point. People have cloud syncing turned on by default without realizing. You know, that could be available to anyone, and if that leaks out, there's no guarantee of the security because it hasn't passed lots of information in governance um, type situations. So, yes, if it was me. I would rather not use my personal device to make these recordings and I would be better off using one that's provided to you, particularly if it's a video camera with an SD card in it or a memory card in it. That way you can keep it within the practice environment and try not to take it home to your personal yeah. environment. Hopefully with this whole 14 fish platform that's coming out, you should be able to just upload straight from your computer you know, from the computer at work straight to 14 Fishes platform and have it saved and all that saved on there anyway. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, on the on your NHS email platform, you do have access to a OneDrive account, and that's also passed a lot of the information and governance um, policies that are involved because essentially it is held the data is held by the NHS.net email servers, which is the NHS essentially. So potentially, I might need to I'll find out some more information about this, but potentially you could use the OneDrive, um, and if I do find any information about this, sort of confirming it, I can put a post on on our website in our forums at hippocratics.com if you remember you can look on our forums and we can find out whether or not that's you can use potentially use your nhs OneDrive to store your videos temporarily yeah okay okay so i mean it's you know if you, if you guys have any other questions we do we do read them it's just that finding finding the time to be able to answer all of them in once in the most efficient way possible um you know, we have our website, which is um, Hippocratics, Hippocratics.com, which on our website, we do have a forum that's available to you uh, to post secure messages on there about any sort of your, any, any of your um, sort of queries or any sort of questions you might have. Or you can email us at info at Hippocratics.com as well. Or you can send a message through our web page and we tend to try and answer those questions. Forum is a good place. You don't, you don't need to subscribe to our packages to join it. You can you can subscribe. Uh, or you can you can become a member of the website and be able to log into a forum. So that's a particularly useful tool for you. Uh, you know, the more users we have, the more likely we'll be able to reply to it, and you can all reply to each other on there as well. It's a forum at the end of the day. If you quite like these videos and you would like us to do more, just drop us a drop us a comment uh, below underneath this video. Um, I mean, other ways we could potentially do, we can host Zoom conferences as well. If there is enough uptake for something like that, we'd be quite happy to do things like that. Would you say, would you agree with that, Anu? Yeah. Um, you know, just to, you know, just as a little bit of a forum type thing to answer any questions you might have about the RCA or training in general. Now, going forward, we do have a lot more content coming, coming to or coming for you soon. Um, particularly relevant to the RCA that we'll be uploading to our YouTube channel uh, with a few extra pieces of content that are exclusive to our video library subscribers who, uh, from our web page. Um, so stay tuned, tuned for that. Anu, have you got any sort of closing thoughts or anything? No, I just wish everyone good luck if you are uh, doing the RCA. And as I'm already said, if you've got any questions, just uh, send us a message and we'll do our best to try and get back to you. Perfect. Well, take care, everyone. Stay safe and I hope you enjoy the weekend, enjoying the sun. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.